Okay, welcome back. We're gonna talk about imperialism now. Imperialism is gonna be one of the main causes, M-A-I-N, of World War I. So first of all, let's talk about our imperialism. And our imperialism is around the same area uh, of time, at the 1800s to the early 1900s. Uh, we're either going to take territories, uh, straight up take them, we're gonna buy territories, or we're gonna get them because we win them and we're given them because of wars and victories, okay? So again, we're talking about Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, he was for imperialism. One of the big things we talked about earlier was the Roosevelt Corollary, and that was uh, European nations do not come over to our side of the world and mess with countries that are near us. Those are our neighbors. We have uh, economic and financial interests there. Do not come over here and, and try to colonize it or try to uh, take over or influence them. That's our side of the world. You stay on your own side. He even had his uh, Navy fleet. He had a special fleet called the Great White Fleet. He painted the ships white and he went around the entire world on a tour and basically just, you know, you floated around. <laughs> and he wanted to show the whole world how BA uh, America was. Do not mess with us. And as you know, uh, this, this policy of stay out of our side of the world or we will, we will, we will mess you up is called the Big Stick Policy or the Roosevelt Corollary. It's, it's basically a warning to not interfere with U.S. interest in Latin America. Okay. So the other foreign policies, and these are again foreign policies, how do we deal with other countries? Uh, his, his successors after Roosevelt, uh, his good friend William Howard Taft took over, but he was kind of like a sheep. He really wasn't quite as aggressive. Uh, Taft had a, a had foreign diplomacy called dollar diplomacy, which was if we give money to these uh, Latin American nations, if we help them out financially, then it's going to imp improve our relationship with them. Okay, and a lot of people saw this as trying to bribe other nations to have a good relationship with the United States. Uh, it was called dollar diplomacy. Okay, remember Roosevelt was big stick diplomacy, so then we have Taft dollar diplomacy. Woodrow Wilson uh, came up with something called moral diplomacy. He was the son of a, of a minister, and he believed uh, that the United States had a duty to share our good ideas, uh, like democracy, with the rest of the world. So his, his policy is called moral diplomacy. And I guess if you think about it, uh, this policy kind of is one we still have today. We're always being the police force for the world. We're always going into nations where people are suffering and there's been a tragedy or there's been a, a disaster or there's a war going on and people are dying. Uh, America, for the most part, is always going in and trying to help out. And you know, in Iraq, in, other, in, in, uh, in, in Korea, in, in Vietnam, all these areas we've gone in our history, we've always tried to spread democracy and prevent the spread of communism, which we'll get to obviously in the Cold War. So these uh, policies, big stick policy, very aggressive, Taft, dollar diplomacy, that's gonna be more financial, let's use our money. And then Wilson's moral diplomacy, also called missionary diplomacy, is sort of spreading good ideas like democracy and peace. So, in World War One, which we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about your rights being denied. Uh, and this happens a lot in, in American history. Uh, whenever America is threatened, our government has in the past, as recently as 2001, started to deny or limit some of your freedoms. And the reason that our government does that is in an effort to make us feel more safe. So we're going to take away rights of people because we want to feel more safe when it's a time of war or uh, crisis. Okay, so one of these uh, examples is what we call the Espionage and Sedition Acts. If you look at that first word, espionage, spy is that middle part. Uh, this was a law that basically gave the U.S. government the, the power to go look and search for uh, suspected spies during World War I. The Sedition Acts were laws passed in the middle of World War I that made it illegal to talk bad about the war, to talk bad about the president, to talk bad about the draft. And if you did say bad things and you were caught, you could go to jail, you could be fined, or both. Okay, so basically, this is the one of the first examples of your freedom of speech being denied or being uh, repressed. Okay, um, another thing that happened in World War One is something called the Committee on Public Information. It was a propaganda uh, organization that meant to get you to feel and think a certain way about the war and to keep supporting the war. It was very biased against Germany. 
Uh, it was it, it made Germany look out to be like they were a bunch of barbarians like in this particular picture uh, this is a, a German soldier carrying a, a, an American and he's obviously a barbarian okay if we saw this today this would be considered extremely nativist perhaps even racist so anything anti-war if you were against the war that was considered un-American you could be sent to jail and you could be uh, fined or, and or both okay <clears throat> here's another example of uh, loss of civil liberties in World War II, uh, a Supreme Court case later came out came, called Korematsu versus United States. But remember, after Japan attacked us, we were scared. So what do we do to make ourselves feel safer? Well, uh, Franklin Roosevelt signed something called Executive Order 9066, and it ordered all Americans of Japanese ancestry into camps. And these camps were in places like Utah and Arizona, even Arkansas. And it's basically prison. And this is for thousands and thousands of Japanese Americans. Not Japanese, Japanese Americans. And so we put them in there because we thought they would be spies and they might be giving information to the enemy. And keep in mind, these aren't like concentration camps like in World War II for the Jews. They weren't being tortured here. It was almost like detention. And they were called detention or internment camps. But their freedoms were denied and they were Americans. Uh, later on, a guy named Fred Korematsu would challenge this. He didn't want to leave his home and go to a camp. So he went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, in times of crisis, the U.S. government can do what it needs to do. So he had to give up his job and give up his home and go live in one of these camps. For uh, Some people lived as many as three years in these camps. Uh, and to find out, after the war, uh, there were no... Japanese spies that were ever caught that were of Japanese ancestry. None. There were some, but they weren't of Japanese ancestry. They were white. So another example of your civil liberties being limited. Okay. Uh, to jump ahead, another two examples of civil liberties. Americans who were unjustly accused of something and lost their rights. We have what we call the Red Scare. World War I, in the middle of World War I, the Russian Revolution, also called the Bolshevik Revolution, happened. And this is when Russians were tired of being uh, broke and starving while their king was living large. So they decided to overthrow their government. And it became a communist government where you had no rich and poor. It was supposed to be where everyone was equal. Okay, And so Americans were afraid of this idea coming over to America and, and basically overthrowing our government. So events in America, we call them the Red Scares. These are in America after World War I and World War II. And the first one, a guy named Attorney General Palmer arrested many suspected anarchists and communists, and he deported them. It kicked them out. They were sent back to their country based on no evidence whatsoever. Uh, the, the worst example of this is uh, two guys named Sacco and Vanzetti were executed because they had different ideas on government and they were immigrants. So they had a nativist judge, and. Uh, they, were, they were not given due process and equal protection and all these things and they were executed for their crime that they committed okay but I think they were innocent okay something else were called the immigration quotas of the 1920s uh, the government limited the amount of immigrants from specific areas of the world if you were from France or Great Britain uh, you were allowed in because you're a lot like us. You, you look like us, you probably sound like us, you probably speak English. But if you were from Eastern Europe, uh, specifically some of those um, countries that are next to Russia, you know, Turkey and uh, Estonia, Latvia, Czechoslovakia, countries you can't even pronounce, uh, a lot of those countries weren't allowed to send hardly any immigrants over here. These were considered witch hunts uh, when immigrants were sent home based on no evidence. Then let's go to the Red Scare number two. Uh, during the Red, the Red Scare II, this is after World War II, during the Cold War, uh, another guy, this guy's name was Senator Joseph McCarthy, he accused not immigrants per se, he accused uh, Hollywood actors, he even accused people in the government of being communist, and uh, many of them lost their careers, and, uh, and some of them even committed suicide because of the stigma of being associated with communists, okay? It's like you're accused of a crime. There's no evidence at all, but people think you did it. People think you did it. And so 10 actors who refused to testify uh, were, were looked at, at being guilty. And so they couldn't get a job anywhere. Okay. Um, also, uh, after World War II, um, we have what we call McCarthyism, which is based on this guy, Senator McCarthy. 
And it's the paranoid fear that everybody around us is a communist. We were so afraid of this communist idea and us losing freedoms that we have here at home. And so eventually Joseph McCarthy was considered a crazy person after he accused the president of the United States of being a communist and he kind of, you know, faded out into obscurity. But it was a scary time and a lot of people lost their careers, politicians lost their jobs, and they never recovered in, uh, in the eyes of the public. So again, these are examples of lost civil liberties. Okay. During the modern era, okay, these are uh, some other examples. Uh, under President Clinton, we had a policy called Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which you could not be openly gay in the military. Uh, this was ended by President Barack Obama in 2011. And again, this is an example of your freedoms being limited because of our fear of something. I don't know what we were afraid of here. Uh, freedom of personal choice, denied, but regained. Thanks, Obama. So thank you, Obama, for uh, giving a specific group of Americans more rights. Okay. After 9-11, uh, two things happened. First thing is called the Department of Homeland Security was created after, uh, by George W. Bush after 9-11. And its agency is to protect us from terrorism. We were afraid of terrorism. And so we have more security at airports. Uh, law enforcement has more power to, to check for evidence of potential terrorists. We have an alert system. Uh, we are on green level, yellow level, red level. That all sounds great. Unfortunately, uh, you lose some of your rights because of the other law that was passed called the US, USA Patriot Act. This law grants power to government agencies to closely monitor American activities related to potential terrorist attacks, which means if you are doing something or reading something about terrorism or um, you know, you're reading uh, I don't know, articles on your Facebook page about terrorism and you like, you like one, you know, the government is going to be able to track you. They read your emails, they tap your phones, they might get a camera out on you, the, the CIA might come to your door and ask you some questions. Um, this is all ways that the Department of Homeland Security gathers information about terrorists. They're basically violating your privacy, so another right being taken away. Uh, after 9-11, we took a lot of potential terrorists to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. This is outside the United States. And we wanted to find out where Osama bin Laden was. And one of the things that happened there was something called waterboarding, which is a form of torture. Is torture okay? Isn't that against human rights? Well, the Patriot Act kind of gave them the power to do that. And especially if it's in Cuba, it's not even America. So again, America and American government restricts freedoms in times of war. Doesn't matter if it was World War I or World War II or the Cold War, or it was the, the most recent war on terror. When we're afraid of something, we start restricting some of our freedoms in an effort to keep us all safe. Okay, uh, we're gonna take a break now, I think, and we're gonna come back and talk about the Bolshevik Revolution and uh, end uh, the start of communism and more stuff along the way. Thank you for listening, that's about 13 minutes.